two one. We are live. This is two O F Entertainment. We're here. We're here. Thank you. We're here. How That's exciting! Week. Yeah, we're looking. And the and the good thing is, is the artist you're going to interview did not fall down the stairs. I'm hoping. Yeah, she's. And then I see her in the green room, so she didn't fall down the stairs. So I'm very excited uh, about this. And she's very quick to get back to the the chair. Yeah. No. Good week. And, uh, lots of stuff on the go here, and uh, boy, there's pop up shows happening everywhere where we are. Probably down That's there great. as well. They're having shows all around. A lot of art being showed right now. Um, it's the spring's coming. I think the energy. All the people have been doing yeah. work over the winter, and and they're now ready to show their wares. So it's it's That'd kind of exciting. Cool. Yeah. So that We're, means the next. All your shows are great. So I'm assuming then all the upcoming shows are going to be like wow. You know what? I'm booked solid right through till May. Uh, nice. As far as we've got some, not only we've got artists and sculptors and different things coming along. So. Cool. A lot of, uh, yeah, our May program is going to be awesome. Uh, artists nice. will definitely want to tune in on that one. Okay. Um, you know, when we have our special guests in that one, I've, we've got a little bit of work to do on that, but we'll right. uh, get them organized. And, cool. uh, yeah, we have uh, Roberta Lashinsky today. Uh, no, Roberta, say. yeah, she's cool. from Melford, Saskatchewan, which is sort okay. of close to the, you know, the edge of the boreal forest and the Canadian Shield. And she's a watercolor painter, and uh, she holds a master's uh, degree in uh, educational, uh, I guess, psychology. Um, but you know, she's picked up a pick up a paintbrush here a number of years ago. So we're getting a hold of this plein air painting outside with uh, watercolors and capturing this rugged the ruggedness of of the terrain. Um, and her vision of how she sees things. And I mean, it's how everybody paints is a little different. And uh, I think everything is not um, re totally realistic. And then some are very abstract and some are in between. And, and so it just, it's just, it's up to the viewers to how that resonates with them a little bit. And she, she has her own visions of what she's trying to convey. So we do want to bring her in and we'll, we're going to talk to her about her journey yeah. a little bit. Hello. Good morning. So that, the fact that I know she's a psychologist, I won't show her any of my paintings because I'll be committed. So it's just all about learning. <laughs> oh, okay, good. That's great. It's I'm safe. good then. <laughs> I'm safe. Thank God. Well, we you two have a wonderful probably. Yes, I probably need more than that, but we're good. Yeah. <laughs> you two have a wonderful show. I will see you after so I can ask my usual questions. And uh, that's it. Enjoy, kids. We'll talk to you later. Cheers. Thanks so much. Uh, see you later. Well, good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing good. It's uh, yeah, we're we're all well on our way to uh, maybe our spring. And we have sunshine this morning too. I was up like I'm a really early riser, and it was cloudy when I first woke up, and the sun came out. It's just so wonderful. So you chomping at the bit to get out and paint? I am actually. I was thinking I might go out later today. Uh, I like to, if I can, catch the early morning sun and the or the evening sun, but I'll, I'll go anytime. <laughs> and I like these spring colors. Like the grass isn't green yet; it's just that, you know, that uh, nice beige golden color. And then you've got the really blue of the melting water where there's water flowing. And oh, yeah. Yeah. every now and then, like the the brown stubble sticks through, and uh, you know, you'll see sometimes. Uh, little bits of snow left and yeah. so uh, it's just such a pretty palette out yeah. there right now yeah that's actually uh, i find the painting uh, plein air this time of year there's still some snow even and it really <clears throat> it really captures the it's almost like an etching where it kind of catches the edges of all the furrows from the farming and you can Beautiful. you know the stubble field and the different things so it gives you really nice lines that show up and uh a lot of times you're always searching for those uh i guess it's the horizon but also the the directionals that happen in a landscape and your work does show some of those as well but it's hard to get how do you get that distance 
in, in you know the depth in a piece of work and it's nice when not necessarily diminishing telephone poles you know can give you or down a road that narrows down but when you're looking at a field it's kind of nice to see uh, you know the delineated lines that a, a cultivator would leave or a combine and the things of the cropping so does that does that play part of what you're looking for do you like the man-made elements that are put into the, the landscape does that convey with you or are you more looking for the it's, natural stuff well honestly it depends on the um i think when i was thinking about this um i was thinking about the fact that for me i like to see something in the landscape speaks to me not just about the land but about life right about human life yeah. and so when i see something that resonates with me a lot of times it's a little bit you know i don't know if i can use the word metaphorical, but something that really um, connects with human beings. So mm -hmm. it might be a structure, like I love abandoned homes uh, and farmsteads. They're beautiful. And, um, you know, the odd time, I like fence posts. Fence posts uh, are really cool. And lots of times the, uh, the, brush grows up right around the fence post making it really pretty and uh, we live in a beautiful area so there's just so much um opportunity we live near actually um you know you were about 60 miles out <laughs> in your uh, intro we're north northeast of melfort yeah. so right up near open lake saskatchewan okay. um i i live walking distance from the resort yeah, and you are you are you are in the boreal forest we are are yeah. definitely and and you know depending which direction you go like far, there's farmland here there's yeah. a little bit more like parkland um you know yeah, it's there, just, there tends to be smaller parcels of land up there not this vast huge acreages that are you know hectares that are down south yeah uh, there are some really large farming uh areas as well but right where we live uh, we're pretty sandy, so you know it's it's not quite the. It's marginal land for sure, it but it's great for painting and. Uh, oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna get Stephen to start up our first image here, and we'll just have that, and we can yak yak while we're. There we go, so yeah, so oh, we're, yeah, yeah. So this, this one, you know, it, it 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 just telling you a little bit exactly what we talked about here, you know, and just. Well, this, this was um, so I as I mentioned when we were talking prior to the show, um. You know, I have a lot of stories about my plein air painting because it seems like it's every every time it's an adventure, right? And I happen to have a couple of friends that are willing to take adventures with me from time to time. <laughs> and so this was take this was painted. Actually, there is a covered bridge over top of the the Torch River, um, right. which is just north of Love, Saskatchewan. Now, Love, Saskatchewan is a story in its own, and it's featured right now in the uh, Prairies North magazine, so it's kind of cool to look at. But this is just a beautiful little river. And so this sort of, it's not really a covered bridge, but it's like a metal, sort of a metal tunnel kind of bridge. Mm -hmm. And so we uh, went almost kind of down and not quite under the bridge, but um, near it and we're able to stand on shore and paint uh, the water splashing over the rocks yeah and, uh, mm. and yeah. the fall beautiful fall colors so um, it's, it's always a challenge you know trying to get water that which is so liquefied to you know feel a part of uh, the rocks and the sand and the thing is trying to and a lot of it is maybe overpainted you know they tried to put too much into what the water is and I, I find that sometimes it doesn't look like it belongs this one leaves a nice little twinkle of sparkle of of uh highlights of rippling of water and you know rushing of water in a, in a shallow listen has you a shallow creek bed look area about it it so, definitely is shallow there for sure and it has yeah. that really nice feeling there's a nice warm feeling about it and i think the water and the sky add just a little bit of that complimentary snap to the painting you know and you know, being a vertical piece as well, which is rare. A lot, a lot of times landscapes are all horizontal. They figure they got to put everything in. And I like that you kind of focused in on one area. It's put your, do you use a cropping guide at all? Or, you know, you just get out there and plein air paint. You just yeah. draw one out first. I've it's gotten very good at uh, 
sort of shutting out what I what I don't want to paint because you know as you know if you've done any plein air painting like there's just so much <laughs> when I first started it was funny because I would start with a scene and before I knew it I was painting way over here and I'm just wait a minute that's not where I'm painting you know so it's you have to narrow in your focus and be really uh able to kind of focus in on just what you want to get right and, uh, yeah. no it's difficult because your eyes are very panoramic you know you you see out here and if you show up with the wrong shape of paper say your paper is square and you're looking at something very horizontal you have to realize you have to lose about 50 percent of that and focus on what is important and i found sometimes when i have taught classes that you need to actually have the person write what is the most important what why did i stop here like ask yourself that question is what is the most important thing here and you can don't have to say that out loud you can keep that it's like a diary you can keep that in your head you don't have to tell the next person what you're doing but you find out it doesn't take long till you figure out where the light is sparkling and what is lighting and yeah i love I stopped because of this yeah it's true and you know it's it's really um you know it's i don't know if it's especially with watercolor but i do find with watercolor you have to sometimes you know you get a pretty area like i'm looking at those white trees in the back there so those are pretty loose and you know if you were to zoom in on them you'd find like they're not maybe completely straight sides but just the way the white was there worked so yeah. you just don't want to go back there. You just look at it and you go, okay, I like how that's working. So we're not going back there. Or those plants in the foreground, nice and loose, leave them that way. Don't go back and try and paint all the leaves. You know, so it's uh, it's really a challenge to stay loose. And yeah. I find it interesting because, um, you know, even though I love to see um, really hyper-realistic paintings where people have a high degree of skill, at creating something that's very real looking that's not my goal mm -hmm. uh, my goal is to give more of that impressionistic look and try and get the feel of things and so uh, by being able to stop myself uh is part of the skill of just mm -hmm. you know being able to say okay leave it alone it's time to stop <laughs> and i know that's challenging for artists i've talked to lots of artists that, you know, it, you know, those are, you know, some will dibble dabble on the same piece for two hours and it, it never gets resolved. Um, and I've seen some come in with a large hockey brush and, uh, you know, inch and a half, two inch. And in about four sweeps, it's done. Uh, and then there's a, they're very minimalist style, but you have to have patience in those ones because it's kind of wet and wet, you know, you, you, and if you don't like, what do you how do you feel like dealing with the weather elements while you're painting with watercolor outside i mean you got extreme heat mosquitoes wind all those elements how do you keep your paper uh, in in the where you want it to be like whether it's a hard edge dry or whether you want to wet onto wet how do you how do you approach that do you work on more pieces than one or do you have just one uh, i usually try and have two going at once because that gives me a chance to let one dry depending on the weather like you say i've i've painted in some really humid conditions and you get lots of that uh like with watercolor it does some wonderful things actually sometimes because it, your paper is so wet it's still soaking in and kind of spreading and yeah. so the challenge then again is just to leave that and see what happens you know, there's a lot of um, watercolor is, I would say it's kind of a collaborative medium. You have to, you really have to work with your medium. You can't really just, um, you know, paint over something. Once it's down, it, you're kind of committed. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, depending, you know, what pigments you're using and you get to know your paints, which ones, you know, you can wipe off a little maybe, which ones uh, will lay over top of the other. You have to work light to dark. So uh, you have to get those light areas in first, you know, so that's challenging. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, if you're in really dry, hot conditions, your paint puddles can dry up in the time that it takes you to put down a few strokes, you go back and your paint is dried up. Mm -hmm. um, I've also painted uh, in just above freezing conditions and uh, where it's, it's almost crystallizing as you're painting mm -hmm. and then it's not drying at all on your paper so you know how to you know how to paint in those conditions and your water stays nice and clean and doesn't freeze you yeah, add you, you add vodka to the water 
<laughs> I haven't because I haven't gone out when it's that cold. You don't use real expensive vodka. You just, you, <laughs> as long as it's clear. I've and heard of people that do though. Yeah. And I, uh, I remember watching uh, years ago at Olympics and there was some, they were featuring some of the artists in Europe that were painting during the Olympics. And uh, that was one of the tricks that they used was to add a little bit of vodka to the water. They kept it so that it didn't freeze on them and it was clear. And, uh, to and they could have a nip if they needed to. They could drink their they could drink their dishwater after they <laughs> your paint water, <laughs> yeah. Brush water, yeah. They drink their brush water. I would like to try a little bit more in the winter. What I tend to do if I go out in the winter is I have a steering wheel easel. And so uh it's just like a steering wheel tray that goes on the steering sure. wheel. And so I'll just push my seat back, hang my painting supplies on the That's headrest cool. of the passenger side, and then I can just paint a winter scene uh from my car. So do you have do you have paint spots all over your car from no you, because watercolor washes off. <laughs> I haven't taken my oil, I do have oil paints as well. I haven't taken those in the car. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I I was painting with a friend years ago when he was doing a we we're in a marsh area and I was I was doing a painting and he was next over to one side and he was doing actually I didn't know it. He was doing my portrait of me painting. <laughs> and so and he and he's he didn't like to show his work very much. But anyway, back at the cabin, he just said, well, show me what you did. So now he finally got him to show me. And he showed me. And there's these little specks of paint all over the painting. And I says, what's that from? He said, well, you were flicking your brush. <laughs> so every time I flicked my brush, it went on to that portrait. Well, that's called collaborative artwork. It was collaborative art. So you have to, <laughs> yeah, you have to pick your friends that you paint with, I guess. Yeah, for sure. I have my grand. Yeah, this, this piece is lovely. I mean. I've, you know, it's lovely to see these little pathways that we love to walk on in the forest and, uh, you know, that light, it, it gives, it gives you this, I guess, effervescence feeling. I, lo I love in the spring, first thing in the morning in the summer to walk down a pathway in the forest that is chandeliered with light. Like it's just, they're speckled all the way through. Um, and it, it just, it, there's an energy there that you're, you're, flit, you're, you're on a, a path that's not hard it's bouncy a bit and you you can walk on it and it's uh yeah so this one is where is this one up near this candle one is actually north of la Ronge, okay um near the um there's the sand banks those white cliffs and okay. i can't say the name of them it's a but they're prehistoric uh sand cliffs and this was the path out there um you know talking about the you know, the forest, sort of the canopy. Uh, in the pine forest, it's so cool because there's not a lot of undergrowth. And so it's almost like a park where everything has been cleared out and you can walk anywhere amongst the trees. Uh, so this one, um, you know, actually kind of goes down the hill there. You can see in the distance and, uh, you know, walking down to the river. So, uh, yeah, it was, again, another adventure, uh, something to see. And sometimes it's not the thing you went to see that strikes you, but the journey. Have you ever had the bear waiting for you on the trail? I've had a bear come up behind me. <laughs> and uh, my painting friends and I actually did have a bear encounter at Amisk Lake, which is in far in the northeast of Saskatchewan, almost uh, at the Manitoba border. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so we had, we had a, a CO trying to get a bear out of the town at Denaire Beach when we were there and uh, we had to quickly pack up our painting stuff and do, do you take bear spray with you or I have bear, bear yeah. spray in a, in a bell or something it's important that artists know that take something with you uh I mean you just want something to scare them away a little bit or you don't want to po get a pokey stick and poke them but you just kind of <laughs> you you kind of just kind of you know they all have their different thing don't look them straight in the eyes and you kind of walk away but you try to just, if you make enough noise, uh, pots and pans or take a bell with you, a fairly loud one or something. Yeah, I play and, music sometimes just to, but yeah, uh, the bears the are, they're kind of, they're yeah, just some of the music you could choose from. I, I won't go into the <laughs> different genres of music you could play that drive me nuts, but I don't Teddy know. Teddy Bear's it, Picnic would be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> that would do it. I, I'd be running the other direction as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, they're, I love bears. I love them, but from a distance. The problem with the bear thing is we've we've made them cute and cuddly. Yeah. And we have 
silly people from, well, I will, I'll say from all over the world to come, even with our bison and buffalo, you think, well, I can just walk up to them and pet them. Uh, bear is cuddly, uh, you know, and especially these nice polar bears, they only eat you. You are lunch. And they don't, you know, people don't realize that you, you have to respect, you know, it's nature. And, uh, you know, you, you, you are the food chain for them if you're not careful. Yeah, and, uh, I'm pretty yeah. careful. And, the, you know, the day that I did have the bear coming up behind me, it was I had the dog with me, which is not a good thing. I don't yeah. usually take her with me, but a, a bear will chase a dog. And then the dog's response is to run to its master. So yeah. uh, you wow. really don't want to have your bear, your dog with you. So when the bear did come up behind me, um, I just quickly got the dog into the back of the vehicle first. And then my painting supplies chook, into the passenger side and I decided to leave it for another day. I think actually that image might be here. That autumn at the crossroads is the, the picture. We'll, come, we'll probably come to it here. I think yeah, got, when I I've got a number of show people, this, this one's got the bridge image in it across the Creek or in the, you know, the Creek bed. Now this would be a Creek bed that's feeding into the lake or something. I would imagine. It is. Yeah, actually. Yeah. And I think now I, I looked this up, but this actually, I think ends up, eventually flowing into Cumberland Delta. Okay. Uh, you know that geography better than I do, Paul. We're, we, Paul and I share Saskatchewan as our home province. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I've, I've been up in the north, north is just, of uh, La Ronge as well. Beautiful country, large shield country, and it's, yeah. it is gorgeous. Um, and it, seems every, is it seems every time I go up there, I get about half the days are rainy. And lately, it's been half the days are smoky. Oh, yeah. yeah. Last year, I was hardly out at all because it was so yeah. smoky. Well, you know, we talk about that. It's going to like that changes the whole color aspect yes. of what you do. I mean, yeah. you do get really different colored skies and sunsets mm -hmm. and things. So people can, you know, watch that. It, that that can happen with smoke and sun. Yeah, and you can't see the distance as well either. Like it's. Yeah, everything shortens up. It's good awesome. like looking through a beer bottle at times. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so this one is far north in Saskatchewan, um, north, way north of Mississippi. Uh, the Churchill River has yeah. a beautiful little waterfall called Smith Falls. And th there's a really fun story all around finding that fall because it wasn't labeled and I knew it was there. Uh, and I was with three other friends and we just kept journeying and journeying along until we were almost at South End, which is very far north. <laughs> and then we turned around and said, it's got to be here somewhere. And so we... We went into this little town called Brabant, and it, it's really a settlement. Um, there's one business there, I think, like a service station, you know, that has maybe some fast food. And asked the young kid that was working in there, um, you know, where we could find Smith Falls. And my maiden name is Smith, so I really want to find Smith Falls, right? <laughs> so, uh, so we went to find Smith Falls, and, he, you know, he looked on the map and the entranceway, and it was all dirty with fingerprints from different people that had maybe everybody else looking for smith falls well truckers and geologists and things that travel up that road because there's a lot yeah. of mining activity up north there and and that sort of thing so anyway um so we he looked at this and he's like oh no he didn't know where it was and i said oh that's just really weird because someone you know the map shows that there's a waterfall near here and he says, oh, the waterfall, <laughs> it's over there, he says. So it was just like a less than a, probably less than a half mile. Or They need a sign, maybe just a sign. There yeah, go. there was no signage. So, uh, and it, you know, usually when you go to a waterfall, it's all caged in with page wires so nobody can get hurt. And this one is not. Like, it's just, you walk along the edge and the Churchill River is just roaring yeah. below it's you. Roaring. <clears throat> yeah. The fall is not high I would say it might be like six to eight feet maybe high but it comes from height in the distance as you can see yeah and uh so so it was really fun finding it and I we felt like explorers when we when we found it and <laughs> yeah is, uh, it, always, it always amazes me you know we have very rushing water and you wondered how uh even on the north Saskatchewan how the uh, uh fur farriers could on their york boats go up and down this river and my goodness like some parts are sandbars you can't now but part of that's due to damming but in the day i guess it was fairly deep river but it roars and if you have to go back against it and it's fine if you're going back to hudson's bay that's the direction of the water but when you're going the other direction 
<clears throat> you're going over bigger things that, that look like For this. Sure. So you're definitely portaging yeah. uh, a number of times a day. And I found that even with my, I, I have to portage occasionally to get around to if I'm going to be painting, but what do you do for like packing your stuff? Are you packed light a little bit? How can I pack everything in a backpack, including my easel and my tripod that my easel sits on. Yeah. It's, it's not light, light. And I know some people go really light. I just have a really good backpack. So it weighs about 11 pounds uh, when it's completely packed. And I, it has a good cinch at the front and a good one around the waist. And I find that, it, you know, when it's, a well-supported backpack doesn't. Yeah, it's you know, important that you. Take a lot of weight. Yeah, it's important you. Uh, and some of them have those trusses that around your body and those that keep your back straight a little bit. You know. Yeah, so it, you it's really you know a good backpack. Yeah. Necessary as far as I'm concerned. Some people will go with just a pocket thing in a little bag. Yeah. And well, you know, I like commitment when I hear. You know, somebody's they brought their stuff. You know, I'm going to do a serious painting. You you might do a nice little painting in a little sketchbook, and you got the little mini uh, watercolor set. But I well, think I'm kind of hardcore that way. Like, and I'm not as hardcore as I. You know, I've seen the work of Charlie Easton, who's a a Canadian artist who climbs mountains and paints, you know, from the mountain peak looking at another mm-hmm. mountain. But uh, I'm not hardcore like that. But I do, you know, I do like a short hike and then we're bag lunch and spend the day in a spot. Yeah. Um, you know, you might tour around the area a little bit to find different scenes. But um, I think the main thing is when you're out there, just to be aware if they've heard of bear sightings or if they've heard of other uh, things that you know, fallen logs and trees and fires and different things can happen. You understand your escape plan before you go yeah. into somewhere there like that. It's nice to go in as a group as well. Yes. But, uh, you know, it's, I just, yeah. you know, the safety aspect of get people that might listen to this. Say, oh, that'd be really fun to do. They should plan it. Don't, don't just, just don't do, just go out there all by yourself and just take your husband with you, your wife with you, whatever you're going to do or another yeah. fellow painter. It's fun to go in a group. I'm a bit nervous going by myself yeah. uh, just because of that, because I get involved in my painting and I, I think, you know, is a bear going to come up behind me <laughs> when I'm not paying attention? Asking if you're lost. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's usually what happens when you paint in the wilderness and you're lost. There'll be somebody will find you. It's amazing that you'll be painting and all of a sudden there's a person standing there looking at oh, what yeah. you <laughs> And you go, where did you come from? Like I'm in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, and I kind of like to be isolated from people too. I <laughs> I don't want to be where people are, you know, looking over my shoulder a lot because you know, as you know, as a painter, you know that paintings go through a really ugly stage before they get good, and you know if somebody's looking at it when it's in the ugly stage, you just probably don't want anybody to see that. <laughs> no, you know, I don't. I don't think there is. I think they like to see the progress of things. I mean, it's sort of like. You go and you you see a house and you've got a there's a basement been poured. The next day the <clears throat> the walls are up and then they keep coming back looking. You know, oh, I want to see that completed. What what color? You know, the look of it. So I think <clears throat> having them see how a painting starts is a really good educational aspect. It is. It is. No, well, they say that this you doesn't just happen immediately, <laughs> right? It's a process. Yeah. You kind of have to do some explaining. You know, I think that's, that's fine. You know. But you know, when you talk to your you talk to your plumber and he might explain to you how that thing is toilet's going, his meter is still running. He's charging you. <laughs> like if you take an hour of his time to learn about how the toilet is working and all the other plumbing is done, he'll talk with you. <laughs> but at a hundred bucks an hour, you know, he charges you for that. Well, the artist doesn't, you know. A lot of times they say, you know what, if I'm gonna tell you about how to do art, we'll just call this a workshop. And I'm, I want $50 or $75 and you can sit and listen to me talk while I paint. Yes. And, but I'm just saying, you yeah. know, we don't, we don't do that as artists and we do spend time educating. Yeah, we uh, do for sure. Along the way. And, uh, and, you know, on that note, it's just, um, you know, you mentioned that I had career and family first and, uh, you know, it's kind of surprises me. Like I've always been creative. I'm a creative, but I haven't always been an artist. And, uh, you know, I was not the good art student. You know, it, this is a skill that I've learned and I love learning. And so what I've learned about art and about painting is, well, number one, 
uh, just like a lot of things when you start, you first find out what you don't know and how much there is that you don't know. And um, there's just so much to learn and it never ends. It's just a journey that is going to go on and on and on and you'll never arrive. So it's really cool that way. And it's a, a good problem solving, um, you know, brain workout kind of activity because every stroke you make, you are problem solving. You know, is this the color I need? Is this the the intensity I need? You know, what happens if I do this? Right. How much water do I need now? Uh, how can I keep this clean? How can I make sure that these don't run together? Or how can I make sure that they do run together? You know, so it's uh, it's just for anybody that wants to embark on a new uh, venture. Painting is just so much fun. And I love watercolor. Um, mm -hmm. Many people are intimidated by it. Uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts and I hear many really well-known, accomplished artists say, I used to try watercolor, but I gave up on it. So it is a challenging medium uh, that you have to think ahead and plan. And uh, But it's very rewarding. And it's also good if you're not too worried. You know, if you're able to take that time to just say, what if this happens and be okay with it, you know, as it happens where you have your, uh, in watercolor, we call it happy accidents, right? Where something happens that you didn't really plan, but you want to keep it. Yeah. So that happens, <clears throat> that happens. And I think, um, you know, trying to keep, if, if your style is to keep it looser and in those things, uh, but it's always about observation and understanding different types of paper, cold press, hard, you know, hot press and uh, some of the rough papers. And whether you're painting on 300 pound arches is, is quite different than painting on a on a smoother paper. And, <clears throat> you know, uh, there's ways of keeping paper wet longer and read the books and take a few workshops. I think I encourage people yeah. to do that uh, for understanding purposes and try and find your own way. Like you try to find your own vision, which is the way you like, you work a fairly warm palette. I see that you like the warm colors and, uh, and that's, it's distinctive in that and trying to find your own vision as well as somebody saying, Oh, that's Roberta's work. And you don't even put your name on it. They know it's your work. Um, that takes a long time, not only for you to hone your skills, but to hone, the viewer's skill to understand and follow. And that comes from them following you in your art and loving what you do. And, uh, you know, this is a nice little warm road roadway. And uh, I think yeah, this we, was the, the bear one. <laughs> this is the bear one. Okay. The bear one, yeah. 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 And, and you, didn't, you didn't put the bear in there. Then that's good. He no, was, no, he was behind me. <laughs> <laughs> right. He's behind. <laughs> so, but this was fun. It's just so beautiful. Um, you know, on these back roads, this is fall, of course, and I love the fall colors, but uh, it's, you know, as I said, even the spring, you know, the winter, the snow, there's just so much beauty and mm -hmm. uh, it's just so fun to capture it. I'm just moving us along here. Yep, that's so good. I wanted to get to this picture. I mean, we're, you know, when you, I, I you've, it's just like a portrait, this one three trees and because you're up front really close there's no depth much in this one it's it's all foliage and trees and you haven't stepped back and showed much of the sky it peeks through in a couple of little spots but it's really about these i guess they're a poplar tree or a birch yep. tree poplar, uh, yep. poplar tree probably more and uh it's it, like i said it's a portrait um of, of three trees and trying to, that's what I get from it. Um, what what stopped you here when you, what, what made you stop and paint this piece that we're just talking about here? That we hey, um, this one, it was the sun uh, coming through on the, uh, against the white of the poplar bark. You can see it glinting in a few places. Mm -hmm. Those poplars can look so white and yeah. they vary actually quite a bit. And I was actually, my daughter, um, works with agriculture and the environment and I was asking her one time why is it that you know sometimes you'll go to a bluff and there will be these really straight tall white white poplars and another place you know they'll be different and yet they're all the same type of poplar and she explained to me that well poplars start from uh runners under the ground right the 
the tree will send out a, a there's runner. A mother, yeah, there's a mother tree. Yeah. yeah. And so that's why they look all similar in the same place. And these ones, uh, I don't know, they just struck me. This was early fall. So we already were seeing some browning of the underbrush. And yet the, tr the leaves were kind of losing their color a little bit. Uh, not quite so green, but not, and you know, starting to turn yellow. Poplars, when they turn in the fall, turn a bright lemon yellow. And so uh, this was on the way to that. And yeah, it was just the side of the road and the sun coming through. So some sun and some shadows and and some depth with this, the sun kind of going through there. Mm -hmm. And this one was playful. This was a playful picture, just mm -hmm. wanting to relax, enjoy the brush strokes and you know, a little bit of splatter there. Yeah, uh, I see that? <clears throat> a little bit of splatter. Uh, just uh, I, have a I have a toothbrush, an old toothbrush I use. Uh. <laughs> I don't do that much anymore not the mostly plein air paint with oil right now but it's a little messy when you splatter paint with your finger and oil paint is kind of yeah nice. no but, doubt. uh no it's there we all go through little techniques and mostly i don't do you use mascoids at all much at all or do you not a lot them? i used to um i will use it if there's sometimes you know as i said sometimes you can get carried away and you lose your whites and so uh, I want to be careful of that. So once in a while, especially if it's a small spot, uh, I will put a little bit of masking fluid on or uh, masking tape. So I'll tape out so that I can be free and just paint. And then I just. Yeah. People and, understand you can mask an area out even with paper and tape. You're right. And then, uh, you know, that that frog tape that you can peel back up off without tearing your surface of your paper up. Yeah, but mostly I've gotten really good at just leaving the whites. Yeah. Oh. Well, you got to learn. That's a, you know, it's a very delicate learned skill. It's and part I of the journey. <laughs> no, no, it does, it does leave a bit of a hard edge, but, you know, it works really nice with the sawtooth grass, sawtooth grass in the foreground and the, that little pieces of white. You need that. You can't take everything away. You you right. need to You need to leave some things for your painting to have some life. Yeah. And uh, you can't paint every spot. Um, yeah, you need the contrast too. Well, that's the one advantage to, you know, it's not like when you're painting in an oil, you you tend to, if you have a gessoed white canvas, you tend to paint it all out. You remove the white, but then you're, you bring your lights back in. You work dark to light with an oil. Acrylic right. uh, acrylic is a little bit more like um, a watercolor, usually the other way. But now with some of the new open acrylics and different things, you can paint opaque stuff over top of uh you know as you don't they won't blend together but and if it's impassoed things can move forward and they, they don't blend and mix and make mud so i think that's that's really the thing is with watercolor is really watch your colors because i think you can be into muddy colors really quickly if you've you mixed a whole bunch of, if you've mixed a bunch of tertiary colors together uh you lose you lose the essence of that color yeah. um but so much yeah, and you know, my foray into oil was very interesting too when you're talking about process mm. because having oil well the reason i decided to go into oil as well although i think we just have watercolor images here yeah, just the um, is is that it stays wet you know and you can muck around with it a bit and that's what i wanted i wanted something that i could mm. you know if i feel like it i can just go play and go back into it but it's the exact opposite thinking process from watercolor so then i'm starting out with my darks and moving to my lights whereas in watercolor i'm starting with my lights and moving to my darks. so it's really a good brain workout switching back and forth between the two and so sometimes i'll do a painting in watercolor and then i'll go and do it in oil and i'm really way more comfortable with watercolor than oil so, so how do you present these pieces i mean most people have to mat them frame them and glaze them and with glass, it's tough to ship. Um, sometimes there's a glare on the paintings as well. And so how else can your watercolors be presented to people? What other things do you, how do you work on that? Okay, so as you can see, a lot of mine are framed, uh, but I also have a, a technique that I've learned and some watercolors are using this now and I love it. Um, this is uh, mounted on a, on a, a uh, birch panel so yeah. the paper it's painted on the paper but it is then glued onto this panel it's varnished glued and then 
preserved with a uh, cold wax and uh, sanded along the edges so everything's nice and smooth. I leave the edges unpainted. They're just a little bit of wax on them. And then uh, I can put the hanger on this. Whoop, this one doesn't, yeah, this one just has a sawtooth hanger. So yeah. I can just put the hanger on and it's ready to put up on the wall. And right. it's kind of a more of a modern look. I find, sorry, I'm having trouble finding the camera here. Yeah. Um, people like the, the wider um, depth here. Yeah. But um, if you wanted a frame around it, you could take this to a framer and they would put what's called a floating frame around it, which would just put uh, kind of a brown or yeah. whatever color edge right around it. <clears throat> Well, understanding framing really adds a cost, a big cost to uh, to work. Um, a lot of times a frame will even be worth more than the the, the paint, a small painting, for instance. But I just had that experience yeah. <laughs> with getting something framed. It was like $150 to frame it. And so now, you know, to yeah. sell that painting, you have to sell it for so much more just to get right. your framing money back. Yeah. And, I, and you're trying to make decisions for... And the buyer as to what, well, how they like it to be presented. So a lot of times it's easier for the buyer to decide their own frame, right. uh, you know, and they take it to their framer and, and do that and uh, let everybody know that uh, Roberta is going to be having an online show with artists in Canada here in a couple of weeks and uh, her work will be available much. What we're seeing here today, some of the pieces that we're seeing here today will be available as well. So. Yes. And I tend to mat them. So I do have, yeah. you know, someone that does some matting for me. Right. And so they come in a nice, you yeah. know, it frames them nicely. That piece that you're looking at now is uh, for people that paint with watercolor or, or artists, they understand a half sheet. So this is a half sheet size, which is quite large for watercolor. Uh, watercolors, we tend to not get super huge that often, although some some people are. You get your big brush out, your big brush. Yeah. yeah. So this one is... Uh, what is it? It's a 20, 15 by 22. Is that what it is? Uh, that would be a half sheet. <clears throat> yeah. They're usually 22, 30 is yeah. a sheet and half yeah, sheet. So this is a half sheet. Yeah. So um, it, it was fun. And it was, this one was actually, again, far north in Otter Lake uh, area. And it was from a photo uh, from a, an excursion that we did a lot of photo taking just so that we could work on the photos um, on our own time in the studio. Right. Yeah, no, they're, uh, yeah, is it's, uh, and I was just going to ask you that if you did work from photos and it's, uh, it, do you just shoot them with your, with your phone, those kind of photos? I do. And I, it's a struggle because I prefer not to, um, you know, photos change things in ways that can be very, uh, just sort of flattening. I don't know if that makes sense, but, um, but I do. Often when I'm plein air painting, I will take a photo so that once the painting comes home with me, um, you know, I always, uh, I have a, a fellow artist uh, in the community who always says the painting fairies need to do their work. So when you leave that painting, sit for a day or two, and then you go back to it. Sometimes you look and you go, it mm -hmm. needs this or it needs that, or, oh, I really like how this dried on here, you know, because the paint changes as it's like kind of settles into the paper. And uh, so when I'm plein air painting, you know, oftentimes it gets a little touch up in the studio so that, you know, if I want to brighten something, darken something. Another thing that happens when you're plein air painting is sometimes the paint just soaks away into your paper. And you, you think you have a nice bright painting when you're out in the sunlight and you come back to the studio and look at it. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's just not bright enough. So do, you, do you feel that once you do your, say you sealed it and you put it onto that board? that that richens the color a bit like the wax the wax does it gives it a really nice this is a matte wax it's not a sheen wax and so it just i don't know how to explain it even just a really nice patina i guess would be the word just a yeah, yeah it's well, very it seal, it seals it up it makes it so that it's durable um and i think it helps protect um you know the layers that are there right. so I think the understanding of the watercolor is not meant to put in direct sunlight in your living room somewhere. Yes. So it's nice to have, you know, that neutral, you know, it's still, you're not losing any of the, the color and things by doing it. So it's, it's been yeah. rich, enriched a little bit. I so, do use all artist quality materials. So that's the that's right. best paper you can buy. Well, it's, important, it's important to right. understand if you see watercolor paper is not cheap anymore. Yes. And the thing is, uh, 
understanding that um, good watercolors, a couple of good brushes is all you really need, two or three good brushes um, and good paper, and you can produce nice work. If you give, if you don't have any of those three, your work goes, it's, it's harder to work with things. If you've got a brush that looks like that, it's really hard to get a pointy edge if you need a round to get in there. And if you need to put a flat area down, it's very hard to paint a flat area with a brush that's got a, like that. So understanding you don't need, you can spend $100, for instance, and you could be well on your way to doing some nice little pieces of work, uh, even if you had to work from the kitchen table. Um, True enough. So I True enough. people to just try it. I mean, yeah, watercolor is something that is easy to clean up and put away. And yeah. you know, your painting isn't wet; it's dry when you put it away. Pretty much, you know, yeah. it might be damp, but uh, it's not like the oils. Yeah. I actually have like a bit of a block when it comes to getting into the oil paints, just simply because I know it's going to be messy, and you know, I you, I feel like when I start out to make a painting, I'm committed for a while here because I want to stay there and and work with it. Because it's well, smell is also a big part of it as well. There's a lot of uh, aroma coming off of oil paint and cleaners and thinners and different things. And those are, there's all are not good anymore. Ones, I but, use a lot of the fragrance or the scent free, whatever you call them, fume yeah. free. Well, there's water, there's water based oils yeah. as well, but they still have you can't smell it, it's in the air. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah. It's good to have that ventilation to do that but this is a lovely little piece i i, I love this piece i, I love the rock i know? love this one too and it always just kind of i don't know those trees that grow out of rock grow out of rock i know yeah. they just kind of hang on eh? yeah it's called out of rock because there's there's really no soil there it, it kind of blows me away how these trees can grow and exist and we live in harsh harsh winter conditions and those trees over winter you know just growing on a rock and the mosses that grow there they're just so beautiful i just really love that that's part of our canadian shield this would, yeah this would be a lovely series of paintings is this the rocks and then the trees and the foliages i love the tree it's gestural it it, it says survival when i see that like exactly the reason you're you're talking about and uh i'd love to see more of these they're just lovely lovely pieces of in you know expand this conversation in that tree and its surroundings right they tell me more i want to know more about the land when i see this one here this because it's it's quite different than your other pieces of work yeah it's i find it it's a little um what's the one i want to say it's the word uh sort of alone is that the word i'm looking for it well it is it's the other, ones are, the other ones are a little bit domesticated yeah and, these ones are not. These, this one is really out there. I mean, even with a nice loose background, because that's what it is. When you see the light coming through there, you don't see all the trees. Your eye is focused on, you know, what? I know what the subject is about. It's not about the whole thing. It's about this tree and the rock. So it's just, it's a lovely piece. Oh, I, 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 love love it. I love it. That one hangs in my house. <laughs> there you go. Um, I did have a series of those. Like I, I painted several of the same, and I often do that. So I'll take a subject and I'll just, how big is this? Be, how yeah. big is this painting? Is this that a quarter sheet? I don't know if I have it. Oh, it's right behind me. I think right there. So it the painting itself is probably, I'm gonna say like seven by ten. Uh, it's in a eleven by seventeen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or eleven so by that. fourteen frame. Yeah. So, it's, so yeah. it's it's uh it's not a huge piece. It's no, small. it's there. You can kind of see it there. Yeah. But no. it's got a bit of glare on it because I got some sunshine coming in. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's a it's a love. I love that piece. Yeah. Uh, you know what? But I love my paintings. Like I, I'm a person when I'm finished with it, I love it. And it's funny, and you know, I was. <laughs> it's a hard thing to reconcile. Really with, you please. know, but it's. I heard you on an, on another interview talking about people. You know how they feel when they sell their work. Well, yeah. I feel like I'm selling my child. Okay, so well, hopefully I, not. I sell them. You have lots because... more children. You got a lot more children to give. Up. <laughs> yeah, I love them. Them yeah. because it means that someone else loves it as much as I do. You know, if they're hopefully. willing to put yeah. that that financial yeah. commitment into paying for a painting, they love it. They there's something about it that speaks to them, and so I feel like we're speaking to each other 
through that painting. And so that's the excitement of, um, I think I sold three paintings this week and it's just exciting. Every single one. I'm like, Oh, I'm so glad they love it yeah. because I love it too. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I never, I would never leave a painting or put it out there if I didn't love it. Yeah. This one, I, I like this one because the composition is all driven to the left. It's heavily, the foliage and everything is working very vertically. And then, you know, the eye direction is being directed, but it's really balanced by that huge amount of white space. Uh, and I won't call it white space, but there's lake space in this minimalist image. And it's, this takes design skill. And I, and I, and I appreciate what you've done because I think Thank there's you. a, uh, um, I guess a commitment there of uh, yin and yang of it. They belong together, but one is really, like I said, it's really heavy on one side and, and it's minimalist on the other side, yet it's still balanced. Yeah. This was a plein air piece and this is on Tobin Lake. So Tobin Lake is a, a, a large a world renowned lake for fishing, um, it but it's, it's created because of a dam uh, being put in. So it's a, it's a, a flooded farmland in that that yeah. originally was farmland. The Saskatchewan River. So in Saskatchewan, for those of you who don't know it, we have the North Saskatchewan that goes up through North Battleford and comes sort of toward the south, and the South Saskatchewan that comes through Saskatoon. And not too far uh, west of where I live, they come together. At yeah, up by Prince Albert, they come together and they head to Hudson's Bay. Right. Well, which yeah. The fur, the fur traders were. Uh, coming down those rivers. Yeah, to Cumberland House, actually. We, and we um, yeah, and it's it converges to become the Saskatchewan. And so that's, Co Tobin Lake is on the Saskatchewan River. Right. So. Yeah. No, and I've been up there. I've caught a few fish. It's kind of nice. It Big lake. Area. Yeah. Anyway, the lovely piece here, another one of three trees and just a different feeling of that's uh, probably similar. And that's to the one on the panel. And I always think like really the light, like when I look at, oops, the color in this is a little brighter than it's showing in that photo. Yeah, well, that's what happens with yeah, uh, it's hard to get digital right. images, and they they don't they're they're more of a yeah. I can see the brightness in in your piece there. So uh, this was plein air as well, just down a back road. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, it's, it's available. All of uh, all of uh, Roberta's works available, by the way, and uh, we will be again saying we're having a show an online show with her at Artists in Canada. So in the next, oh, I would say next within the next month. And uh, we're just putting the schedules together, and uh, it's exciting. It's exciting. I'm excited about it. Yeah. And, and I'm back. You're back. Hi. Like a like a bad plague. <laughs> so no, you. I'm looking forward to seeing your show. Your work was, and I'm not an artist, so you know, take for what I say, for whatever. Very whimsical, and I liked it. <laughs> so it, it made me I, smile. I think what I'd like to do, like I feel, and this is, I don't know if I'm using the right word or not, but you know, as as a person who wasn't a painter for many years and then started, you know, did the career and the family and everything first. Right, right, um, right. You know, when you start out, you have that. I always think about kids, you know, we love kids art, right? It's so right. pure and simple. And so I want to hang on to that sort of simplicity that, right. that I have, I think in my work. And so you gain skill as you gain skill, you become more capable right. of doing more detailed, realistic work, but I don't want to go there completely. So it's a, for me, it's a struggle and a fight to keep the simplicity and sort of the innocence. Right. Of, it is, it, it is that, that. it's, it's the whimsical such, I mean, by whimsical, it's just, you look at it and go, oh, that's nice. It's just well, thank you. like, yeah, it's absolutely gorgeous. So here's the, here's the question I ask every artist. <laughs> if some, and Paul already knows. So if someone wants to buy your work, What's it start from? From what to what? And we know it's in Canadian dollars, which is like four dollars US. But what's in Canadian dollars if someone wants to buy some of your children, so to speak? What do you start at? What's it go up to? How does it all work? Well, in in Canadian dollars, um, <clears throat> it goes by size. Okay. So um, I go by per square inch kind of thing, and then okay. I would say if the magic happens you know, it <laughs> gets a little bit more added to it. So um, I know that my prices, I've been told by a number of people that my prices are very reasonable. Okay. So um, it's partly because I live in a very isolated area. And okay. so, you know, my market is different. So getting, you know, getting the, the paintings out to people is a challenge. And so that's why I really appreciate things like what Paul is doing here with Artists mm -hmm. in Canada, which allows us to showcase our art to a uh, a wider audience. Um, so because of that, 
I have, you know, a lot of followers that are local people okay. and, you know, are relatively local uh, within the province or within the neighboring provinces that are buying my work. And um, so it needs to be accessible to them. So right now that's where I'm at. Uh, okay. A big piece, 600, 660, I think is okay. my top price. Uh, low price, it would be probably 150 to 250 okay. right in there. Very cool. So for the people outside of Canada, mm -hmm. like I said, about $5 US and she'll roll it in a tube and get it to you. The shipping will cost more than the painting. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> But the stuff is absolutely, your work is absolutely gorgeous. So um, I'm Just, hoping people do it. We'll have yep. your link below so people can find you. And if you can't figure out how to click a link, reach us here at the show and we will put you in touch with Roberta. And Just a small plug there on our show, uh, her show coming up in the next uh, number of weeks. Yep. Free shipping on her Ooh. show. So don't we decided worry. it was simpler. <laughs> Just yes. free, free shipping. shipping. So, and that's in North, that's in North America. That's in North yeah. America. Very yeah. small difference, probably going uh, into Europe. Outside, right? Country. For Europe, it's just the size of a VW. So don't worry about that. It's <laughs> good to go. So it'll be good. Yeah. So, well, thank you. You've been wonderful. Um, well, please come back and it's tell us how your show went. Oh, well, we're glad you enjoyed it. See, did I tell you it was painless? <laughs> what was that? I said it was be painless, and it was. It was. No, it's fun. I, I really enjoyed talking to you. It's always fun talking about art. And right. your children. <laughs> yes, yeah, so as you said, you have like seventy-five children behind you, so it's good that you're yeah. um, that you talked let about. Let a few of them go. You got to let them go. Let I go. know, and like I said, it's a pleasure and a joy when someone else, um, you know, enjoys the same thing you do, right. and and can connect through an image. So yep. it's awesome. Well, we're glad you and did. Your, <clears throat> and your vision of it, it's really appreciated. Yeah. Thank you. It's very you. nice. Everybody, thank you for watching. Don't forget to catch us next Thursday. Subscribe and like. And for more information on Roberta, all down here. And we'll see everybody next week. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Thank so you. much.